Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messi, and today we're going to look at a device that actually might have been found in a Victorian Cabinet of Curiosities. This is a stereoscope, and this was an extremely popular form of entertainment from the 1850s until around the 1930s. And what this allows you to do is see images in three dimensions. So I don't really think it's a stretch to say that this was the first popular consumer level virtual reality technology. Now how a stereoscope works is by exploiting binocular vision, the fact that our eyes are set a certain distance apart, meaning that each eye sees a slightly different image. And our brains take each view and combine them to create the illusion of three dimensions. Same thing with the stereoscope. This is based on what's known as a stereo pair, which is a pair of photographs taken by a special camera with the lenses mounted a certain distance apart, just like our eyes. And when we look at those images through the stereoscope, our brain combines them to create a three-dimensional image. Now, despite the fact that this is a very simple device and that the principle behind it is well known to us today, it wasn't until 1832 that the first stereoscope was invented by a gentleman named Charles Wheatstone, who you might have heard of before. He invented one of the first telegraphs a year before Samuel Morse, and his was considerably more sophisticated. It actually used a moving needle to point out letters rather than a code like Morse's telegraph. Uh, if you're into electronics, you probably have heard of the Wheatstone Bridge, which is a circuit used to determine the resistance of another circuit. And he was also responsible for a host of other inventions, including, strangely enough, the English Concertina. Now, Wheatstone's first stereoscope consisted of a pair of angled mirrors with the stereo pair mounted at either end so that they were reflected into your eyes. One eye saw one reflected image, the other eye saw the other, and, as with all stereoscopes, your brain combined them into three dimensions. Now, this was, again, in 1832, before the invention of practical photography, so Wheatstone's stereo pairs used drawings or paintings. So, Wheatstone's stereoscope was only ever intended to be a scientific curiosity. It was never commercially successful, and this makes sense because it was such a large, awkward device. It wasn't until 1849 that another inventor, David Brewster, managed to miniaturize the stereoscope. And he did this by including a pair of magnifying lenses. And what this did is allowed you to use a much smaller stereo pair, and it magnified those images to fill your entire field of view, enhancing the illusion. Now, Brewster wasn't able to find a lens maker in the British Isles that was able to manufacture his design, so he went to France and a lens maker named Jules Dubuc, who started producing Brewster stereoscopes commercially. And he also started producing natural stereograph pairs to go with them, at first with uh, paintings and drawings, but eventually, now that the first practical photography method, the daguerreotype or tintype, had been invented, started producing these with photographs. And they saw a fair bit of commercial success at first, but, as with many things, it wasn't until this invention came to the attention of a royal that it really took off, and the royal in question was no less than Queen Victoria herself, who saw and was amazed by Brewster stereographs at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. And after this, the popularity of stereographs and stereoscopes just exploded, and to give you an idea of the demand for these things, one of the first and largest companies to offer stereographs was the London Stereoscopic Company, founded in 1854. And within two years of their founding, they were selling 10,000 stereoscopic views every year. And by 1862, they were selling 1 million views. And some of the most popular sets of stereographs were exotic locations, faraway lands, and scenes like that. And it really makes sense that these would be so popular. Not a lot of people at the time could afford to travel very far. And so having a stereoscope in your parlor was a very cost-effective and very accessible way for people of all classes to be able to see the world and experience uh, all sorts of different sites they would never be able to see in person. Now, 
the explosion in popularity of stereoscopes and stereographs was further aided by the invention of this. This is called a Holmes-style stereoscope. And this was invented in 1861 by none other than American polymath Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he designed this to be as simple, as easily manufactured, and as inexpensive as possible. And he deliberately did not patent it in order to make this technology available to as many people as possible. And it is quite a simple design. So you have here a wooden frame with a little handle. The handle folds so you can easily fit it on a shelf. At the front, you have a wire holder for the stereograph pairs, which are printed on these cards. That frame, that holder, slides back and forth so you can focus the image. You then have your eyepiece right here, which acts almost like a set of blinders to uh, prevent distractions. You have a set of magnifying lenses, which as I said before, magnifies the image so it fills your entire field of view. And finally, you have a divider in the middle, which prevents each eye from seeing the opposite image, the image it's not supposed to see, and further enhances the function of the device. Now, Holmes was very enthusiastic about his invention and uh, stereoscopic imagery in general, and he wrote in an 1859 essay in The Atlantic, The first effect of looking at a good photograph through the stereoscope is a surprise such as no painting ever produced. The mind feels its way into the very depths of the picture. The scraggy branches of a tree in the foreground run out as if they would scratch your eyes out. The elbow of a figure stands forth so as to make us almost uncomfortable. Then there is such a frightful amount of detail that we have the same sense of infinite complexity which nature gives us. A painter shows us masses. The stereoscopic figure spares us nothing. So across the pond in the United States, one of the largest manufacturers and distributors of stereographic images was the Underwood and Underwood Company, which was founded by Bert and Elmer Underwood in 1881 in Ottawa, Kansas. And interestingly enough, they actually started out selling stereographs door to door. So it just gives you an idea of the demand for these things that you could actually have a viable business selling them that way. But their business grew very rapidly and eventually they moved their head office to New York and they opened branch offices in Canada and in Europe. And by 1901, they were actually selling some 10 million stereograph views every single year. And then later in 1910, they entered the news photography business. Now, interestingly, one of the markets that they really tried to enter, and indeed a lot of uh, stereograph companies did this as well, uh, they tried to enter the education market and market their product to schools. And really, this is nothing new. Every time a new type of communications or visualization technology comes along, everybody tries to sell them to the schools and find a way that this can enhance education. And they even produced a book titled The World Visualized for the Classroom, in which they extolled the pedagogical virtues of their product. And here's just an excerpt for you. The stereograph is a superior kind of text, and a good teacher will not have so much trust in mere print. Using stereographs is not play, it is work. It may not be too sanguine to believe that a child may be made thus to know more of the real life of foreign or distant lands and is often known by the hasty or careless traveler who visits them. And I just find that really funny because I can't imagine anything being sold that way today. You know, this is not fun, it's work. Uh, today you would probably emphasize how fun it is and how students are going to be having so much fun that they you know, won't realize that they're learning at the same time. But then again, at, during this period, this is the late Victorian, uh, early Edwardian period, these devices are not being sold to the students, they're being sold to the very strict teachers. So you have to emphasize that, no, this isn't a frivolous pastime, this is actual work, this is actually valuable for teaching these kids. So it makes sense in that context. So as I said at the beginning of the video, the popularity of stereographs and stereoscopes started to wane around the 1920s and 1930s. And this makes a lot of sense because it was around this time that new forms of media, specifically the radio and the movies, started becoming very popular. And something like this uh, started to seem rather old hat. It's just uh, an image, albeit 3D. And so people started abandoning this for the new, far more capable and exciting forms of media that were emerging at the time. 
But the fascination with 3D images really never went away, and it was at the very end of the traditional stereoscope period that we get one of the most popular and classic stereoscope toys ever, which is the Viewmaster. And that was first introduced to the world at the 1939 New York World's Fair. And the Viewmaster introduced a number of innovations, one of which was instead of using opaque cards, used little film transparencies. So you could hold it up to the light and see the images very clearly. And also it mounted multiple images on a single cardboard disc that you could cycle through. And this allowed you to sell somebody multiple views on a single convenient format. And typically these were, say, views of a single geographic feature or location like the Grand Canyon or stills from a film or something like that. It was very convenient to sell these at tourist destinations. And indeed, the Viewmaster remained popular for decades after the 30s and was inducted to the Toy Hall of Fame. And uh, the following decades would see the rise and fall of various 3D formats. There's the anaglyph format, which is the one where the image is sort of skewed off into a blue and a red component. You have to wear those blue and red 3D glasses to see the image. There's, of course, the magic eye. There's the rise and fall in various decades of the 3D movie. We've never really gone away from our fascination with 3D images. It just depends on the media that are available. And now we have far more sophisticated devices in the form of virtual reality headsets. So same idea, same fascination, different technologies. Now, because they were manufactured in such vast quantities, even today, stereoscopes like this one and the 3D cards that go with them are fairly available on the open market, either in antique stores or on eBay. And if you want to start collecting them, there is a wide variety to choose from, from around 70 to 80 years of history. And if you want to know when they were manufactured, if it's not printed on the card itself, there's a general rule of thumb that if the cards are perfectly flat, they were likely manufactured between 1857 and 1890. And if they're curved like this, then they were manufactured from the 1890s onwards. There were also a number of different formats that were produced based on size. And these are the regular or early format, which was 3.5 inches by 7 inches, the cabinet format, which was 4 inches by 7 inches, the deluxe format, which was 4.5 by 7 inches, and finally the largest, the imperial format, which was 5 inches by 7 inches. So this particular home stereoscope I discovered at, of all places, a gun show. And when I saw the cards that it came with, I knew I had to buy it, because these stereo cards, which were published at the turn of the 20th century, show scenes from the Second Anglo-Boer War of 1899 to 1902, and of the Spanish-American War of 1898. And I really wanted to show you these images because they're just neat and I haven't seen them published anywhere else, but I didn't just want to show you the plain stereo card. That's kind of boring. I wanted to show you what they would look like in 3D. Now, unfortunately, it's not as simple a matter as pointing the camera into the stereoscope. That's not how it works but I found that by flickering between the two images in editing, I could give a pretty good impression of the depth and the parallax of the image. Some of them work better than others, but some of them work pretty darned well, and it's a really neat effect. And it, again, gives a really good impression of what it would look like to look through the stereoscope. So without further ado, enjoy.
to the love of a London voice in the cheers of the street rides in the eyes that are watching joys in the quick and hard beat all for the boys who are marching gaily for empire and queen ready to die for a So I hope you enjoyed that. I thought that was a really neat effect, a really interesting way of seeing those images sort of the way that they were intended to be seen. Now, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet more fascinating devices just like this one. And for those of you who might be wondering where my trademark gray three-piece suit went, unfortunately, a couple of days ago, it was stolen. I had it in my car, intending to take it to the dry cleaners, and one day it just vanished. And I'm very sad about that. I absolutely love that suit. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to be wearing this, my second favorite suit jacket, which is authentic 1940s that I picked up in Portland a couple of years ago. Anyways, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.